Mom, what are you doing today? Providence Place, owned by the Sisters of Providence, an ideal rental setting for retirees to continue their active, independent lifestyles. We have bright one and two bedroom apartments, a magnificent chapel with daily mass, restaurant style dining, and wellness and entertainment programs. Call for a tour, 413-534-9700. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real, we'll tell you about a program training clergy and faith leaders and how to prevent suicide. Catholic schools in the Diocese of Springfield are gearing up to celebrate Catholic Schools Week. And we are in the kitchen with Father Brian McGrath as he cooks up a recipe perfect for these cold winter months. These stories and more are just ahead on this edition of Real to Real. Hello and welcome to Real to Real as we come to you today from St. John the Baptist School in Ludlow, one of 13 Catholic schools in the Diocese of Springfield. Next week, the Diocesan Schools will mark the 46th annual Catholic Schools Week, a tradition celebrated with masses, assemblies, and other activities for students, families, parishioners, and community members. We will hear more about Catholic Schools Week as we talk to Catholic School Superintendent Dan Belarjan in just a bit. But first, a serious and sobering topic to begin this program with. Do you know the signs that a family member, parishioner, or a friend may be considering suicide? It is an awkward conversation to have, but one faith-based organization is working to change that. Soul Shop is designed to train clergy and faith leaders in suicide prevention. Recently, the Diocesan Office of Campus Ministry Outreach and the Westfield State University Interfaith Chaplains Council sponsored a day-long training on the Westfield campus. Kathy Harrington reports. We want to be the gate at the top of the hill instead of the ambulance at the bottom. Um, Michelle Snyder is the director of Soul Shop, a ministry dedicated to training faith leaders how to prevent suicide. Soul Shop is really a public health approach to suicide prevention, and it says the community has a role to play. The community has a responsibility. The community can increase rates or decrease rates as a result of, of how we envision intervention. With a focus on intervention, more than 50 faith leaders from around Western Massachusetts recently took part in the second annual Interfaith Campus Ministry Summit. It was co-sponsored by the Diocesan Office of Campus Ministry Outreach and the Interfaith Chaplains Council at Westfield State University. The fact that we are um, bringing this uh, to people's consciousness is, is, is one step to um, helping people feel comfortable about talking about suicide because the more we talk about it, the more we raise awareness around it, the better we are to prevent people from actually uh, taking that drastic step of wanting to commit uh, a suicide. Father Warren Savage is the director and Catholic chaplain of the Interfaith Center at Westfield State University. He says at least three dozen students will seek him out over the course of the academic year, wanting to talk about their suicidal ideations. It's a topic clergy may not be trained to talk about. Soul Shop is specifically geared towards clergy and lay people within their communities. This is great because it speaks directly to the biblical basis behind suicide and how our clergy can help. It helps with their ministries, how you can slowly start incorporating these concepts of breaking down people's isolations and making their congregation somewhere that's open and welcoming to people that are struggling and know that it's a safe place they can come and talk about it. The common ground is the Bible. The Soul Shop training points to scripture about suicide, attempted suicide, suicidal thoughts, and intervention. It helps to break down misconceptions about our faith and suicide. For our understanding, suicide is an illness. Suicide is, is an indication that something's not right. So the sin for me would be not to help this person who's dealing with this, this internal illness. The workshop succeeds when faith leaders go back to their congregations and share what they've learned. So through our leaders is how we get the entire community trained. And we build a network or a suicide safer community that way, where everyone in the congregation feels that they are aware of suicide, they know the signs, and they know how to help someone. 
With eyes set on helping many people, Michelle Snyder says Soul Shop envisions reaching 20,000 faith communities by the end of 2020. I'm Kathy Harrington for Real to Real. And another Soul Shop training is in the works for catechetical leaders in the Diocese of Springfield. Plans are for Sacred Heart in Feeding Hills to host the workshop and we will keep you posted on the date and time to come. Switching gears now with more on the upcoming Catholic Schools Week celebrations, we have with us Dan Belarjan, Superintendent of Catholic Schools. Thanks for being with us on Real to Real today. It's my pleasure. So first of all, in looking at what's happening across the country next week, I noticed that there isn't a national theme for Catholic Schools Week. And also, by the way, there now are actually two separate Catholic Schools Weeks. That's right. So um, what's happened is there's uh, one in the fall called Discover Catholic Schools Week, and then traditionally what's been Catholic Schools Week is what we call Celebrate Catholic Schools Week. And the, the reason that we've done this uh, across the nation is a lot of families are looking to make decisions regarding enrollment of their children in schools in the fall. And so we normally ran our open houses and a lot of our events during Celebrate Catholic Schools Week in, in the last week of January. But as the market has changed, we're trying to be adaptive to that market and making sure that when, when folks are looking for a Catholic school or looking for a school for their kids, that we're opening up the doors of our schools so that they can see the benefits of a Catholic education earlier on. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And in our diocese, we have 13 Catholic schools. Um, what can you look, tell us that you're looking forward to locally next week? So because the shift has gone to celebrate Catholic Schools Week, it's, it's really exciting. And it's what we've done in the past. So you'll see most of the schools will have kind of a special Catholic Schools Week Mass. Um, I know that the Berkshires are getting together all three schools to celebrate Mass with the Bishop, which is was really exciting. There will be trivia contests. Um, there will be a lot of celebrations of the volunteers. So they'll have um, different events at the schools where they have volunteer appreciation. Uh, many of our schools will um, have appreciation events for law enforcement who have been very helpful for them or for first responders. You'll see service projects. You'll see academic bees. You'll see spelling bees. So really in Celebrate Catholic Schools Week, our schools are trying to uh, emphasize uh, the beauty of what happens in a Catholic school and really emphasize what makes them unique and special. All right, it certainly will be a busy week for sure for everyone, but a fun one as well. Thanks for joining us today, Dan Belarjan, Superintendent of Catholic Schools for the Diocese of Springfield. And you can stay informed on all of the happenings in our schools by friending Diocese of Springfield Catholic Schools on Facebook. And still to come on Real to Real. Dan Dumas takes a look at the latest news from the Diocese of Springfield. And we are back in the kitchen with Father Brian McGrath with a recipe perfect for this time of year. These stories and more are still to come on Real to Real. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. I'm Passionist Brother Terence Gallon, your Chalice host, inviting you to take time out of your busy days and join us Sunday morning. This week we celebrate the beginning of Catholic Schools Week 2020 and welcome students from several schools across our diocese. The Chalice of Salvation, your spiritual connection, Sunday morning at 10 on 22 News, WWLP, and coming up next on Fox 23, WXXA. There is a lot of history here at St. John the Baptist School in Ludlow. This elementary school was founded by Father Louis Rodier, who became pastor of the parish in 1913. His one and only dream was to build a Catholic school and staff it with religious teachers. It took him a few years, but by 1925, 95 years ago, this dream came true. And here to tell us more about what makes St. John the Baptist School so special is Principal Shelley Rose. Thanks for having us today. Thank Mrs. you for Rose. coming. So this school, like I said, is nearly 100 years old, and that is such a tribute to the parish here for such a long tradition of Catholic education. Yes, we were lucky to have the Sisters of St. Anne's uh, start the school, and their vision was to bring boys and girls together. So we've been doing that for almost 95 years. And our parish is wonderful. They support us. Monsignor Goslin, our now pastor, um, also supports the school 100%. So it's great to have them. That's wonderful. Now, tell me, what makes St. John the Baptist so special? 
Well, we're all family. We work as a team, the staff works as a team, and it's nice to come to work every day and just have that great feeling of joy and kids getting along and staff getting along. Now, what is the mission that you begin each day with? Well, we definitely want to educate our students academically. That's our most important. But on the other hand, we want to make sure that we also bring about their spiritual growth as well, and academic as well as physical growth. Mm -hmm. And so you must be looking forward to Catholic Schools Week, which is going to be coming up next week. Tell us what is going to be happening here at the school. Well, we start out, um, most importantly, with a Mass at 4 o'clock, and then afterwards we have a Pasta Supper. And then Monday, um, six priests are coming in to say Mass for our third through eighth graders, and we have another uh, person come in talking to our nursery school through second grade. And then Wednesday we have our open house, which we look forward to bringing in. Um, so, and then we have our teacher appreciation and our staff appreciation day this week. So. Well, it sounds like it'll be a busy week for you, and I'm sure everyone's looking forward to all the excitement that goes with it. We are. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Principal Shelley Rose. I'm Dan Dumas with your Real to Real News Briefs. Catholic school students, their families, teachers, and administrators from across the Diocese of Springfield were invited to cheer on the Thunderbirds at the Mass Mutual Center this month. The Mass Mutual Center hosted local Catholic schools as a part of its annual Catholic Youth Night. It was a sold out crowd at the Springfield Thunderbirds hockey game Saturday, January 11th. This year's Catholic Schools Night was held earlier in the month to encourage folks to check out what the Catholic schools in the diocese have to offer. This is a great social event where we can bring all of our schools together to be part of the diocese as a whole, number one. And then two, by being out here, if we have more families out here talking about Catholic education, maybe more families will consider a Catholic school. Francis Prep senior Lauren Welch had sung the national anthem for this event for the last few years now. I've loved every experience here. It's very fun and nice to spend time with family. Even though the Thunderbirds lost to the Providence Bruins 5-2, the night provided a great opportunity to build community. It's great to be here uh, to watch the game and to see our students perform before the game, uh, to know that they're participating, to see the different tables that are here from our Catholic schools, and to see a record crowd here uh, that looks filled tonight. So it's great to be here tonight at the uh, Thunder Change and growth were celebrated in Northampton earlier this month. It's been a decade since five parish families came together to form St. Elizabeth and Seton Parish. Nick Morganelli tells us more. On the feast of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton and Epiphany weekend, hundreds gathered in Northampton for a 10th anniversary mass with Bishop Rosansky, Pastor Francis Riley, and other priests and deacons. A reception at the Elks in Florence followed to conclude the celebration of a decade of five congregations coming together as one. There's a great heritage to the parishes that have been joined as the one parish of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. We've had the Polish-American experience, immigration experience with them, Irish-American, French-Canadian, uh, different people in Northampton. Plus, the, as Northampton has changed throughout the years, we're ready to serve all the different people of Northampton in the best way we can. About three years ago, I came here on a parish visitation. And on the visitation, I saw so many people who are involved in the life of the parish and both in prayer and in service. So it's a good complement of knowing that we're grounded in Christ through prayer and that that prayer leads us to service to reach out to the wider community. Many talents make up a parish. This one even has its own St. Elizabeth and Seton. I used to go to this parish 
before it was St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, and I have gone to it since. Um, and I've portrayed her twice before. I've been told I look like her, so I'm happy to help with that. So she was the first American saint, which is why they picked her for this parish because it's bringing together a bunch of other groups uh, 10 years ago when they, they founded it. The newly formed parish brought together gifts and talents from five other local churches. I came from St. Mary's in Northampton and I'm involved as a Eucharistic minister and I'm part of the prayer team of all the five parishes. I was one of the original members of the uh, interim um, council when we merged and then as we began working together. So I've been doing this for, oh, at least 11 or 12 years. I've also been a volunteer and now I'm the uh, gift shop manager um, for our parish. I've taught CCD. I'm also the amateur photographer for the parish. And basically I do a lot of, if you need me, I'm there. I'm one of the managers of our thrift shop which is uh, in its 11th year of functioning for our parish, and I was a parishioner at Annunciation. In his homily, the bishop shared the struggles and journeys of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton's life, as well as the Magi's, to bring an understanding of how God is working in our lives, even in difficult times. The story of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Parish here in Northampton is the journey a journey of trust, of coming together, and of knowing that no matter what life has in store for us, as long as we have that faith in the presence of God with us, we can be sustained through everything. Commemorating an anniversary in Northampton for Real to Real, I'm Nick Morganelli. And finally today, for nearly 60 years now, one Pittsfield parish has marked the end of the Christmas season with a special tradition that is popular in many European communities. Carolee McGrath has our story. On the feast of the baptism of the Lord, the community of St. Joseph Parish in Pittsfield closed out the Christmas season with the 59th annual Twelfth Night Festival. The Epiphany, which is marked on January 6th, celebrates when the three kings visited Jesus. In many European communities, it is known as Little Christmas. The Twelfth Night tradition in Pittsfield began at the former Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish in 1962. Because the Christmas season in every Catholic church is so very busy, that they decided to actually have a celebration um, after the holidays were over, but before the Christmas season ends. The evening began with a 4 p.m. Mass con-celebrated by Stigmatine Father Robert White, Provincial Superior of the Stigmatine Community in the United States, St. Joseph Pastor Monsignor Michael Shoshanovich, Bishop Emeritus Timothy McDonnell, and Stigmatine Father Jeffrey Deeker. When Mount Carmel closed, we told the people that whatever traditions you had in your home parish, they're most welcome here. St. Joe is, like I said, the mother parish. And we've, you know, I, I was pastor of a parish, the Polish parish and the French parish, and we brought those traditions here and we keep them alive. Youth from St. Anne Parish and Lennox sang prelude music. During the mass, parishioners playing the three kings processed to the altar. Nine-year-old Matthew Hurley and eight-year-old Cooper Brown played the part of the king's pages. Why does Jesus matter? Because he helps us when we're uh, mad. Why do we care about the kings? Um, because they came to Jesus when he was born and they followed the star. Monsignor Shoshanovich says Twelfth Night reminds people of how the kings were seeking Jesus and how Catholics must do the same. Now that we all went to Bethlehem, now we're sent out. That's what the baptism did. It sends us out to keep the Christmas message alive every day of our lives. The wise men didn't stay there. They went home. The shepherds went home. You know, and our folks are going home and we have something to give. You know, maybe they brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but they received the greatest gift, Jesus Christ. You know, that's the gift that we're called to share with one another. A reception was held following the Mass at St. Joseph Parish Center. Reporting for Real to Real, I'm Carolee McGrath. 
And remember, you can always stay informed on all the latest news in the Catholic Church locally and beyond by logging on to iobserve.org. There you can read articles written by our Catholic communication staff, as well as view archived episodes of Real to Real. That's iobserve.org. I'm Dan Dumas, and those were your Real to Real news briefs. Our last story today is very appropriate for this time of year, and especially if you are like me and just a little bit under the weather. We visited Father Brian McGrath last week, and he has a recipe that is just what the doctor ordered. So what do you have for us today, Father? Well, I thought in this winter months, you know, a nice pot of chicken soup would make a, a nice meal. My favorite. Sounds great. Yeah. So to do that, what we're going to have is some sort of a starch. We'll talk about which one we choose, probably the, the noodles. Mm -hmm. Of course, the star of the show is the chicken, but we need a stock. And so you can buy set stocks, but we're going to make it right from the chicken itself. And then, of course, vegetables. And we'll talk about that in a second, All too. Right. So let's clear our surface and okay. we'll get started. All right. Well, we washed off our chicken really well. And, and the trick with cutting up a chicken, I think, is finding the joints. Oh. So I kind of get down into it, and then I go, where's the shoulder? There it is. And then all I have to do is just cut it down right there. But all I'm going to do is add it right into the water and bring it to a boil. Then this is just going to be cooking for a good four hours. Right. So you, you don't add anything into the water, just water. Just water. And, and, you're and it's basically your stock. however much water you want mm. to have for soup. Right. So we've taken our chicken off the stove. What we want to do is take out the meat so we can have the stock by itself. Mm -hmm. the meat's really hot right now, yeah. so we want to let Be it careful. cool. So I've set up a colander over a pot just to catch the little drips because there's still some good stock dripping off the meat. But see how tender it's become? Mm -hmm. I love this. It cooked about four hours, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So we'll put this back on the stove to cook. Okay. We'll let the meat cool while we cut up our vegetables. All right. So we get our carrots and our pepper and some celery and some mushrooms, but you can really add whatever you feel Anything, most comfortable right? with. Yeah. yeah, some people like corn in it or peas, or mm -hmm. you go in your refrigerator and you open up the drawer and you say, let's cook that because it's, you know. Mm -hmm. So yep. we start with, I like my carrots first. And uh, I never peel my carrots. I Wash don't either. Thoroughly, I'm but... too lazy. And but why? Why? Pe it's not like it really has a skin on it. Right. It's just. And we talked about cutting stuff. I mean, I, some people don't know how to cut. We always use our fingernails to hold stuff. So if you're gonna cut anything, you're gonna go into a fingernail rather than your own. Yes. That's why we're letting you doing letting you do the cutting now, Father. <laughs> So you're using for one whole chicken, how many carrots do you think? Maybe two, maybe two four. Two carrots, depending on how much you like carrots. My kids would pick the carrots out. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing with celery. You know, you can do to your taste. Mm -hmm. I'll just do a couple of things of celery. And some people would take off the, ski, the, the little strings of the celery, but I find this to be just fine. I actually, when I make chicken soup, I actually take this, the leaves, and I throw that in. Yeah, that's actually the, really delicious. Yeah. My grandmother taught me that. Um, let me put these in the pot. Okay. Now, some people don't like mushrooms in their soup. I love mushrooms. I so love I, mushrooms, I don't too. Adding. And think, what are you going to put on a spoon? So I'm chopping them up so that they're... Now we've chopped the mushrooms up, I like to add a little bit of pepper. That'll be colorful. Something. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got our vegetables simmering in our broth, and now we're gonna take the chicken that we've let cool off a little bit, and we're gonna debone it. And if you see, it, the stuff's come right off the bone. Yes. You always have to be really careful because they're so teeny tiny little bones that yeah. like that. And... and I also be aware of, of uh, like I say, teeny bones, this and cartilage. The cartilage, yeah. This... Mm -hmm. But you're making soup, so if you, it's like when you eat fish soup, you just be aware there might be a bone in there. Right, right. 
more important is to remember which side I'm putting the bones on. <laughs> bones go to the right, the chicken goes to the left. It's good for the soul, right, Father? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so many memories, I think, that people have of chicken soup. Like, you can go back to being a little kid, homesick from school, and your mom brings you a bowl of chicken soup to your bed. Right. Or you go to your grandmother's house on Sunday afternoon and you've got the smell of the in. chicken soup yeah. and the big pot on the stove. And my grandma used to make chicken soup every Sunday. We would go over to her house and in Polish they call it rasu. And we had those little noodles that you showed at the beginning with um, the thin noodles. Right. Yeah. This is pretty close to being traditional yes. chicken soup that you grew up with yeah. as a kid and yeah. have all those good memories and it's really good in this winter time if you have a cold or you know you're under the weather or you're just feeling a little down in the dumps you know mm -hmm. maybe because mm -hmm. it's so cold outside yeah. and yeah. brings it brings everybody into a happier oh, state this, I, I I start with just the smell you walk into yeah. a kitchen that has a pot of chicken soup going and the whole place just lights up. It's the comfort food of the winter. Definitely, yeah. So I think our stock is boiling and our vegetables and our chickens in there. We're gonna do our noodles. We've started a little pot boiling. These are the good noodles. These are right from Poland. Right Father from Daniel Poland. Gave them to me. But I still think, like you say, keep them separate from the regular stock yeah. because you can decide how much you wanna cook up there's nothing worse than soggy noodles that have been sitting in soup for days. <laughs> so while those come to a boil, and again, like you say, it's just a couple of minutes. Yeah. We'll spoon out a little bit of our broth. We used to fight for all the big pieces of chicken when I was growing up. Who got more chicken in their soup? <laughs> well, I'll pick out the big chunks. I want the big pieces, Father. <laughs> just kidding. It looks so pretty, too, with the red pepper. I never really thought of that, but it looks very colorful. Let me take some noodles. Perfect. All we need is some rye bread, and grandmother would be proud. My grandmother would be very proud of you. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, like you see the chunks of chicken and the different colors. Yeah, it's very nice on a in the middle of the winter to have color yeah. and warmth and all this goodness, steam. <laughs> mm. Well, so from the beautiful Berkshires we, to your families, we hope you have a safe and healthy uh, winter. And if you don't, get a cup There's of chicken soup. soup. Yeah. <laughs> Bon appetito. Our thanks to Father Brian McGrath for opening up his rectory kitchen to us, and I think I might need to make a pot of his soup tonight. For this week, that's Real to Real. Thanks so much for watching today, and thanks also to everyone here at St. John the Baptist School for hosting our visit today. Remember, for more updates anytime, you can find information and news on the Catholic Church, both here in the Diocese of Springfield and around the world on our news and information site, iobserve.org. We are also on Facebook, updating daily while our reporters work on stories for Real to Real. So check us out and friend us at Catholic Communications. We will see you next week for another edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you. See you then. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.